Iran's key challenge right now is to get through its uh, putting aside the uh, the pandemic that we're dealing with right now. Currently, it's to get, it's to get get on with its um, political system. It's just had some elections. Um, the hardliners have been given really free reign. Um, whether that's going to improve the chances of negotiations with the West, particularly the United States, I doubt. But it has to come through this period, perhaps exceptional period, maintaining its relations with Europe, um, making sure that it's, uh, there's a possibility for some sort of reconciliation if there's a new administration in Washington. And locally, it needs to try and limit its competition with the Saudi Arabia, particularly, uh, and the United States, to prevent a local incident becoming a major conflict in the region. Um, those are the immediate uh, requirements, but I think that what else is required is that the, the regime in Iran tries to understand and come to terms with how it's going to relate to the GCC states. And that means not just Saudi Arabia, but the UAE, but Bahrain, Qatar, and so on. And I think that they are very much a hostage right now to its bad relationship with the US and vice versa. So the two interact, and um, the Gulf states need reassurance from the United States, but sometimes they get too much reassurance and they become activist, and uh, the Iranians feel they have to respond. That's particularly true in the, in the region. Um, sometimes the Saudis are calling for American responses, military responses, which the Iranians consider aggressive, and they respond by targeting Saudi installations or Saudi allies. So I think this, this whole thing is intertwined and it's going to take a little while to work out. But I think that uh, it may begin to do so after, uh, after uh, 2020. I think that the Islamic Republic has to start looking at its immediate region, uh, the Gulf, um, Afghanistan as well, Iraq. Uh, with much more clarity and a lot less ideologically. And it'll have to start preparing to see how it can establish relations with Iraq, which does not upset the Sunni Iraqis. And with the Gulf states, try and work out an arrangement so that uh, differences of view with the United States don't lead to conflicts. Well, as I was saying, just now to to a class, what's really interesting is how different the Europeans are to the US vis-a-vis -vis the Middle East and Iran. And the reasons are very clear. One is at least three of those countries have had a colonial experience with the region, uh, British, the French, to some extent the Belgians and others, have had some sort of relationship in the past with the region. But I think more importantly is that, the, that they are Europe is contiguous to the Middle East. It, it's adjacent to it. Um, if Turkey ever became a member of the EU, which seems doubtful today, it would take the European borders to Syria, which shows you that in some ways the Middle East and North Africa are to Europe as the southern borders of the United States, Mexico and Guatemala are to the US. Well, this is not true of the U.S. The U.S. has very little direct interest in the Middle East, less and less in terms of energy. To some extent it has with, uh, with uh, Israel, but Israel needs less and less looking after. It's militarily strong, economically strong, and there's no real threat to it. And its relationship with the Gulf states is transactional, by which I mean that uh, the United States uh, has a sort of protection racket with the Gulf states in which in, a, in exchange for taking care of their defense and selling them arms, uh, it, it makes many, many billions in its um, trade with them. So the United States interest it can be transactional. It's not exactly the same as the Gulf states interest and um, it may vary and it may in fact recede with time, whereas the Europeans are fated. Just think of the migrants, think of 
most, something like 40 million Muslims live in the Middle East, in uh, Europe. Almost every Middle Eastern issue, whether it's um, jihadism or the Palestine question, or even anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism, are political issues in most European countries. They're domestic issues. So the Middle East is a domestic issue in Europe. It's not at all in, in, uh, in the United States. So I think that Europe has an interest in making sure that wars don't uh, expand or continue. Uh, Europe has been very active in taking in refugees since 2015. They're declining now, mainly coming now from Libya and the North Africa. Uh, the regional states have been very active in taking refugees, uh, Jordan, and uh, Lebanon have taken very, and Turkey have taken very large numbers of refugees, and the Europeans have helped them do that. Sometimes helped fund them, do, fund them in camps. So I think that Europe and the Middle East, and Europe uh, and uh, Iran and its nuclear program, they take a different view from the United States. The Europeans believe in diplomacy, and they believe that that they can build on diplomacy. The United States feels that they can coerce Iran into doing things that the Iranians do not want to do. So, so far, the United States has managed to increase tensions and, and incidents in the region without any sign of success. To explain is not to defend. In other words, I think there's a, uh, one can make a very good case for what the Iranians are doing without necessarily making a judgment as to whether they should be doing it or whether it's the right thing. Or another way of putting it is that if you want to understand an area or a country or a people or a person, you have to put yourself in their position and say, how would I react if I was them? What motivates them to do it? Now, in the case of Iran, it is a revolutionary, self-proclaimed revolutionary power. It is active in pursuing an ideological, its ideological goals, active in the sense of promoting them verbally, sometimes supporting groups that support it, and so on. But by and large, what isn't understood is that Iran is a complicated society, even the politics are complicated, that there is no monolith in the country, that the country has evolved, but that generally speaking, Threats, coercion, and bullying work against the interests of the country doing it. And the Iranians are very sensitive or alert to the possibility of being coerced because they feel that, um, in their view, the revolution has always been misunderstood. In their view. Uh, one can argue that, that it's been misunderstood or understood very well. But the fact is, the Iranians consider themselves to have been um, targeted from the beginning of the revolution, first through Iraq and the Iran-Iraq war, subsequently with regime change and uh, the military build-up in the Gulf in 1990 uh, till today, and of course much, much bigger build-up in 2003 till today. And therefore they feel that their position has not been taken into account. They have legitimate interests in the region, they're not always expansive, they're quite often defensive and that they're not heard. And one of the reasons they're not heard is because they don't have normal relationship with the US, uh, diplomatic relationship. And uh, one can argue, you know, who's responsible for that and who's, uh, who's the guilty party, whether it's not self-inflicted and so on. But to understand, if you want to deal with a, a government and a country as important as Iran, one has to understand where it's coming from. And without that understanding, one isn't going to have any success. <laughs>